Welcome uh, to our, our panel this afternoon. I'm Brian Croxell. I'm one of the digital humanities librarians here uh, at Brown. We have, as you can see up here, we have a panel this afternoon rating writing, race, and education in history on the web. And turns out uh, this panel happened already this morning at the History of Education Society, which is taking place in, Bra uh, in, in Providence uh, this weekend. And so this panel is, it was put together by our three panelists, uh, and I was invited um, to, to chair the panel. So we, we've already done this. We had a warm-up. This is going to be even better. Um, but we, when the panel had come together, we decided, I asked if they'd be willing to come in and talk at Brown as well because the, uh, the subtitle is colon three digital book projects. Each of our scholars is going to talk about digital book projects they're involved in. And as many of us in the room know, Brown University and the Brown Libraries have a grant from the Mellon Foundation for publishing digital book projects over the next coming four years. Um, and so our talk today is sponsored in part by, by the Mellon Foundation as part of our uh, future of, of um, scholarly publishing series that's been going on this year and last year. So we're really glad to have this. In fact, this is the first panel of the year on the subject. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce our panelists quickly, um, each of them, and then they will each give their talks. And I've got one or two things to say by way of summary, and then it'll be questions and answers. So in order of, uh, of last name, actually, no, we, we switched Esther and Ansley. So we're going to start with Matt Delmont, um, whom many of you might know uh, because he's been at Brown once or twice before. He's a professor of history at Arizona State University. He did his PhD here in, uh, in American Civilization at the time now, American Studies. He's the author of three books, including Why Busing Failed, Race, Media, and the National Resistance to School Desegregation. It came out this year from UC uh, Press. Jack Doherty is professor of educational studies at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. He, uh, I, I teased him at the last one. I said he has one real book. Uh, he has more real books, but his first book that came out in print only was More Than One Struggle, The Evolution of Black School Reform in Milwaukee came out from UNC Press. He's done four, five, three. There's, there are other uh, books that, are, that appear in digital form and in print form. He'll talk about them. Um, and, 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 and that's what he's been doing for the last decade, is thinking about how to put things uh, online. Uh, our last panelist is Esther Sina. Sina, I even asked and I, I switched. Uh, Esther is a French student from École Normale Supérieure de Lyon and is currently pursuing a PhD in History and Education at Teachers College, Columbia University. She's a Fulbright Scholar studying issues of inequality in American education. She works for the Educating Harlem Project. Uh, Esther's absent uh, colleague in this presentation is Ansley Erickson, who joined us at the panel earlier today, who is Assistant Professor of History and Education at Teachers College, Columbia and is one of the project leads on, on educating Harlem. So I will turn the time over to our panelists. Uh, thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Brian, for the nice introduction. It is great to be back at Brown to share a panel with uh, both of you. Um, the presentation today is based on a book and digital project. Um, the book is called Why Busing Failed. It came out earlier this year from University of California Press. Um, and like for all my books, I created a digital project that goes along with it. It uses a platform called Scalar. Um, it's developed by the Institute for Multimedia Literacy at the University of Southern California. Um, it's open access and it's free to create accounts, so uh, you can create an account for yourself, you can have your students create accounts, as many as you like, as many book projects as you like. Um, what I want to do is walk through today sort of what the impetus for me for creating this project was for this book. You can find more about it at whybussingfailed.com, and if you have any questions, you can reach out to me via email or on Twitter at, at Matt Delmont. So the Scalar project for Why Busing Failed is structured slightly differently than the book. So the book is pretty traditionally structured, eight chapters, uh, analytical argument that I carry throughout. The Scalar project takes about 25% of the material from the book, puts it online, but I've broken it up in different, piece, different ways. So I structured it around the idea of 12 different ways to teach busing. I'm trying to provide sort of bite-sized, 500 to 1,000 word arguments for how I think we're not teaching the history of busing in the right way, and I'll talk about what I mean by that. 
the goal for me here with, the, with this project though is to try to give scholars and average Americans more resources to reckon honestly with the history of race in our country, particularly the history of school segregation outside of the South. So for me, there are two things I want to emphasize today about why I was drawn to a digital platform to present this kind of research. One is strictly technical. So I'm a historian of media, historian of civil rights, historian of, of urban history. As a historian of media, one of my primary sources is television. So for this project, I watched hundreds of hours of television news footage to try to get a sense of how this issue was covered in the national news, how Americans were exposed to school desegregation. It's very hard to present that in a book. Right? I can talk about it, I can describe it, I can footnote tell you where I found it, but I can't actually show you what it looked like. So one of the appeals of Scalar for me is when you go online, you can click on these, these video clips and actually watch the evidence that I'm talking about. I'll show you this clip shortly. The second is a more theoretical point. When we talk about this quote from Char philosopher Charles Mills, his idea of epistemology of ignorance, and then explain how it relates to my project. He says, imagine an ignorance that resists. Imagine an ignorance that fights back. Imagine an ignorance that is active, dynamic, that refuses to go quietly, not at all confined to the illiterate and uneducated, but propagated at the highest levels of the land, indeed presenting itself unblushingly as knowledge. So I think it's important here that ignorance is not just the lack of knowledge. Right? When I try to understand why the history of busing is presented in the way it is, it's not just that people didn't know the story, it's that people, and people in power, purposely misunderstood the evidence. They purposely skewed it in ways to advantage one interpretation of the facts rather than another. Right? So part of the idea of getting this material online is to try to give people resources to understand what actually happened and get more of the primary sources in people's hands so they can get a fuller picture of, of what the story looked like. Let me start with the television news clip because the news media is one of the primary sources of this, this um, epistemology of ignorance, of shaping how Americans did or did not understand the issue. This is from September 1974. It's really the start of the Boston busing crisis. The Boston school system is scheduled to begin busing Thursday in compliance with the federal judge's integration order. Opponents of the busing plan shouted their bitterness at a rally today and refused to listen to the man regarded as the state's most popular politician. Jackie Castleberry reports. Eight to 10,000 parents and children came to Boston Common to protest the court-ordered busing. They carried signs, sang songs, and heard angry anti-busing speeches. One of their targets, pro busing Senator Edward Kennedy, tried to speak. The parents blocked his path to microphones and refused to hear him. Are you going to listen part of our people speech? don't care to hear you. What's your kids, Teddy? As Senator Kennedy retreated toward his office, the crowd began to push, hurling eggs and insults. Just as the senator reached shelter inside, the crowd rushed, pounding and then shattering the glass window. After more speeches, the crowd ended today's protest singing, God Bless America. Jackie Castleberry, CBS News, Boston. I can show you hours of footage that looks very much like that. The reason I emphasize television news is because it really helped frame how Americans understood and how scholars have studied this issue. What I mean by that is it set the periodization, so it encouraged us to look at Boston in the 1970s as the starting point for civil rights struggles in the North. It encouraged us to focus on a certain set of people, in this case, frustrated and angry white parents as the, the locus of the story, and it focused geographically, so it put a lot of emphasis on Boston. I choose these images purposely so usually when we teach the history of civil rights, we'll start with, in terms of school segregation, we'll start with Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, or Little Rock in 1957, and end with Boston. Right? That this is where civil rights and school segregation runs aground. <laughs> it's important that the image on the right, there are no black students there. Right? It's a, it becomes a story that's about buses. Right? Busing, school segregation, whether it was in the South or in the North, was about the constitutional rights of black students. But when it came to Boston, the way news media covered it, they made it a story about the anger and frustration of white parents. So part of my product is to try to push back against that. Let's say that that takes work. So I'm writing a blog piece right now for the Smithsonian's uh, Ose Can You See blog. They asked me to do something about the Boston busing crisis. I said I'd be ecstatic, be very happy to. The material they sent me were these items. This is material culture related to anti-busing protesters in Boston. Now think about this for a minute. If you, they asked me to write about the history of Little Rock, and sent me stuff related to white protests in Little Rock, but nothing about the Little Rock Nine or Daisy Bates, we would know that was crazy. 
right? The story about Little Rock was a story about black students trying to claim educational access. The story in Boston is the same, but the material we have, even at our nation's most prestigious institution, is all focused on white people, right? There were black civil rights activists, black students who fought for educational rights in Boston. The Smithsonian doesn't have any of that. So I'm trying to tell a story about civil rights in Boston through these items that sort of flips the script on it. I want to highlight three things that the book is trying to do and what the digital project by extension is trying to do. One is to decenter Boston in the 1970s as the locus of this story. So resistance, organized resistance to busing for school desegregation actually starts in New York in the 1950s, just after Brown versus Board. These mothers are marching in Queens in 1959 to protest a plan that was going to send 400 black and Puerto Rican students from an overcrowded school in Brooklyn to a school in Queens. No white students are going to be moved. This was a one-way busing program. But they're already carrying signs using this language of busing. I found this one on eBay. I love this sort of busing creates fussing, right? Now, it's important that busing is a code word, right? They're not carrying signs that say, we want whites only schools, or we don't want black and Puerto Rican students in our schools. But that's the subtext, right? No one, had con well, no one was concerned about busing. No one used that term until it was proposed as a way to try to integrate or desegregate schools. The second thing the book is trying to push against is this idea of de facto segregation being somehow innocent. So when you actually look at Judge Garrity's order, what led to busing in Boston, it was intentional. What he said was this. The court concludes that the defendants, the Boston School Committee, took many actions in their official capacities with the purpose and intent to segregate Boston public schools, and that such actions caused current conditions of segregation in the Boston public schools. Plaintiffs have proved that the defendants intentionally segregated schools at all levels. Right? That's not de facto, that's de jure, that's intentional school segregation. That's why buses were rolling in Boston. That's the constitutional crisis. Right? James Baldwin has a quote about de facto segregation. He said, de facto segregation means that Negroes are segregated, but nobody did it. Right? That's the epistemology of ignorance, the sense that we have no idea how New York became segregated. We have no idea how Chicago, Boston, Providence, how these cities became segregated. We know that. We know the evidence, but it's trying to get that evidence in front of people and force people to confront it. The third, I think, most important is there's massive civil rights movements all across the North, Midwest, and West that get written out of the story if we just focus on anti-busing protesters in Boston in the 1970s. Ruth Batson was one of the most important national civil rights activists. She was the most important one in Boston. She fought for over three decades to secure educational access for, for her students, for her, her children, but also for black students across Boston. When we focus on Boston just in the 1970s on the anger of white parents, we write her out of the story, right? And that's a, a significant problem. And this is not just Boston. Uh, in New York, there's a massive school boycott in 1964. Chicago, a similarly massive boycott in 63. This was true in, um, in Cleveland, in Boston, other cities as well. New York, by numbers, was the largest civil rights protest of the era. 460,000 students stayed out of school. The March on Washington, by comparison, was 230,000 people. Right? I don't think, I'm not going to make people raise their hands, but I don't think most people know that story. Right? We don't usually teach that as part of the civil rights history. And I want to talk about why that is. So let me first show you a couple of clips from that school boycott to give you a sense of what, it, what that looked like. So the chant there is Jim Crow must go, right? Jim Crow is the system of apartheid segregation that was in the South. When I show it to my students, I ask them to think about what does it mean that we have teenagers marching through the streets of New York in the 1960s chanting Jim Crow must go, the system that we usually associate with the South, they recognize as being something that's harming them in New York, right? It looks slightly different regionally, but the school segregation context is quite similar. One more clip from that same rally, a young man uh, talking about what they, were, what they were fighting for. Just on the subway. After chasing the horse, do you expect violence here today? No, sir, not, not if, uh, no, we don't expect it, but uh, it can happen. Horses and, uh, look at, look at the uh, blue uniform. You ask me, do I expect violence? Violence? None of us have any weapons. No, in fact, uh, last week, uh, Tuesday, when we were over here, nobody, nobody started no violence but the officers, cops. Yesterday, he chased us down with horses, splitting us up, and then we wouldn't let us go on the subway. All we want is equal education. That's all. 
equal education. Thank you. Good old so the goal of my book in the digital project is try to bring this history to light, but also try to understand why don't we know this history? Why is it so difficult to talk about this? There's two answers to that. One is that this was not covered with a sense of moral urgency at the time. So this is a New York Times editorial that they wrote that was a scathing review of the, the boycott. It said, civil rights leaders who seem hellbent on staging a Negro and Puerto Rican student boycott have set out on a reckless course. A boycott can do no good. It's the violent and illegal approach of adult encouraged truancy. Right. Usually when we think about the relationship between the news media and civil rights, we think that the news media played a really progressive role in terms of opening the nation's eyes to the horrors of what was going on in the South. That's a true story for about a decade, from 1955 to 65, but only if we focus on the South. Right? So the New York Times, television news, did play a very brave role in terms of looking at Little Rock, Selma Montgomery, and exposing those horrors, bringing them to national audiences. They were much less bold when it came to what was going on in their own backyard in New York, in Chicago, and Los Angeles. Part of this is that they fundamentally could not believe that school segregation, residential segregation, would exist in New York. They just couldn't believe it. This is the epistemology of ignorance. They refused to look at the facts honestly. The other reason it's very hard to teach about these things now for us to understand this history is that the clips I just showed you are not publicly available. Right? Whereas the Boston one I showed you is one you could find probably online. You can find all sorts of stuff about the busing conflicts of the 1970s. The clips from New York I just showed you, I had to wiggle my way into the ABC and NBC archives and pay for those to be digitized. Right? These are not things that have been available and accessible to historians' fingertips. Right? So let me conclude there. So the appeal for me, again, of these digital projects is twofold. One, I can show you the actual evidence I'm using, the visual materials, but also by making this open access. Now, when people Google Ruth Batson, when they Google school boycott, when they Google the Civil Rights Act and the loophole that allowed school segregation to flourish across the North, there's more resources here for educators, but also citizens who want to understand this history more fully. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Matt, for getting us rolling. And uh, close that one here. Bus pun. Ah, bus pun. Didn't realize I told one there. Thank you. Um, and uh, also to help out here, um, uh, what we also did is we have one link to all of our projects and all of those links as well. So this is, uh, remember, we were at the History of Education Society this morning. So this one here, bit.ly slash all caps HES 2016. It takes you to our conference proposal, and um, you can see you know, how to contact all of us. But there's you know, the abstract. People have actually written some questions already from the other session. Just a small little thing, but I keep telling academics, it's like, rather than hiding all this good stuff in your hard drive, it's like, it's, you know, it's so easy to take a, a conference program and, and you know, your session and just share this material. It's a simple Google document. Uh, when you're at the session itself. So that's there for any of these links, materials. Um, the presentation I'm going to show is actually one of the links in here as well, and I'm going to take it right from this link here, which is already open over here. And I'm going to talk about um, On the Lines, the current book project I'm working on, in the context of open access books. Um, and I think the, the thing to start with here is, is also, you're hearing just me, I'm the you know, faculty member on this project, but as you know, especially those of you who do digital partnerships with everyone, um, no one does a digital book project alone. Uh, picture uh, along with me, over the course of the past five years, I would say close to 100 undergraduates, librarians, um, software coders, uh, people who work at my campus, Trinity College, partnerships we've made with the Hartford Public Library, the University of Connecticut, and everyone who basically has some skin in the game, and they're mentioned in the, con in the contributors page. Um, so I'm the one that uh, comes out and talks about it all, but there's a, a big partnership behind this. Um, I usually have to explain to people who aren't savvy to open access what this concept is. So when I'm pitching this to academics, um, who are the h history faculty and authors and so forth, I have to explain to them, hey, this is what open access means. It's you know, when you have uh, no price barriers and no permission barriers um, for this type of research. And they usually are familiar with, maybe they've heard of open access journals. I have to carve out more space for what open access books are. I point them to the directory of open access books and try to get them thinking about, you know, if you're doing, like in history, book length publications, it's like you have to think differently about how could we do not just an article, but an entire book and the digital evidence that goes along with it as an open access project. And have to show them what some real, you know, what do these scholarly open access books look like. I've had good fortune over the past couple years to be involved as, as co-editing two open access edited volumes. 
writing history in the digital age, a number of historians trying to write about how our authorship changes in the digital world when anyone can author history about the past on the web, and also uh, a more pedagogically oriented volume, lots of uh, uh, faculty were describing how we're trying to use the tools of web writing to sort of like think differently with our students about how we do work together in classrooms and so forth. Uh, both of these were with the University of Michigan Press, and I keep emphasizing to people, hey, a lot of these innovative open access publishers are really embedded within a library. It's the University of Michigan Libraries that has really paved the way for rethinking funding, for rethinking uh, infrastructure about you know, what it means to be a press. And in, I don't know, these crazy people have this idea that you should have places that promote knowledge that should be freely shared. I think they call these libraries. Is that, are you familiar with the concept? Good. So I'm a big believer in this. And um, what I tell people from the get go is, listen, as an author, these are available for free online and print for sale at a reasonable cost. Um, and we've even pushed the envelope. You can do open access book publishing as traditional peer review, or you can do what we did, open peer review model. That's where the press designated and commissioned four experts. And at the same time, we let the public look at the drafts of these uh, chapters. In each case, we got about 1,000 rich comments before we even finalize the book project. So as people know, this is a different way of doing things. Let's bring it back to this particular one. I'm on this panel here today about uh, writing, about race and educational history on the web. And that's because the current project my students and I are working on, this on the line, this is the one, it, it's not done yet. I'm embarrassed to say that this one is, it's taken about four years longer than it should have. I think what happened along the way was, well, to be honest, we discovered so much about just the process that we ended up writing three other books while trying to finish this one. So this is the one we're trying to piece together now. But On the Line is very much an historical monograph. It's based in the metropolitan Hartford, Connecticut area. I'm trying to explain how schooling and housing came together to shape the city suburban region and how civil rights activists have tried continually over the years with different types of strategies to challenge those boundary lines. We argue that we're really into making visible the hidden race and class boundaries that divide the region. We're trying to tell the stories and retell the stories of people who tried to cross over, redraw, or erase these lines. I'm obsessed with boundary lines by doing this project, and I am sharing the book on the line, online for free. I, I basically have been discovering how we can actually cross some boundaries with the technology of today and with the open access philosophy that can reach people with stories that wouldn't have reached them otherwise. This book in progress is under contract, Amherst College Press, like University of Michigan Press. It's another library-funded academic press, and they are open to these arrangements where even though we're not done, we're allowed to share our work in progress online because the entire product will be online for free as well. So we can go to the link right now. I'll show you one or two images of what it looks like, and I'll, I'll tell you uh, 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 more about why I think it matters this way. Um, on the line right now, um, anyone can go to the website and read chapters as web essays online, or they can go and download the PDF version, or if you're a Kindle reader, the Mobi version, or if you're an EPUB reader, the EPUB version, all for free. This is the way it's a press books platform. We'll talk about that in a minute. But that's how that's set up. And if I, if I think about what I'm really trying to do here with my, my students and I, was we're trying to tell these types of stories. Here's an example about uh, federal lending and redlining. I have to sort of connect the story of housing with the story of schooling, often stories that are told in two separate silos, even within historians. We tend to have urban historians who tend to focus on uh, uh, matters of, say, cities and suburbs, looking at housing or interstate highway development. And then we have education historians who tend to be in other silos, other boxes, who talk about schooling and social change in different ways. And I was trying to bring these stories together. I need to be able to not just insert images of, see, the, these are the notorious redlining maps back in the 1930s, the federal government worked with private lenders during the Depression to try to jumpstart the economy and basically mapped out different areas. This is Hartford, Connecticut. This is the suburb of West Hartford nearby. And the federal government was, with local people on the ground, rating different neighborhoods about what mortgage risk they were at, about whether or not it was a good loan to make, to try to jumpstart the economy. Green was the best possible, and red was, hence the word redlining. These people who were the, deemed as the worst possible loans. But we need to take people further inside that story in this way, being able to sort of reconstruct that 
image map into a more interactive map and embed it in the book so that people can zoom in on different neighborhoods, find where they live, and see what the actual details were. What were the appraisal reports for certain neighborhoods? If I zoom in on this one here, this is a sample report. If the federal government had just looked at just the physical terrain of neighborhoods or just the, the dollar value of the housing stock or was it brick or wood and made ratings that way, that would have been one thing. But instead, the government went further here and actually rated the social composition of the residents. Uh, what was the occupation of people there and how did this fit into their rating? Um, what's their estimated income? Uh, what are foreign-born families in the area? Oh, this is an Italian neighborhood. Um, uh, what, how many percentage of Negroes are moving in here? Uh, is it an infiltration or not? Are there relief families, 1930s language for families uh, receiving federal assistance? Um, uh, in, in making these comparisons all the way through, there's this clear evidence of racism and I need to bring the attention to people about how our structures, our government-run structures, were actually shaping the neighborhoods we live in today. In fact, at the bottom of this, you can see the federal agents and the local lenders were saying this, this particular neighborhood was, uh, it was right on the edge of the city going into the suburb of Bloomfield. And this was labeled here as largely given over to the Hebrew race, although the better class Italians are now moving there as well. You can sort of see this evidence that really stands out, especially for local audiences about, I had no idea. I, many, many people look at this and they say, I thought people just decided where they wanted to buy homes. I didn't see the structures that were drawing lines and encouraging investment in some neighborhoods rather than others. So that's the story that I need to tell. And telling it with maps embedded in the book itself has been the most effective way I've found to do this, especially because, if you can't tell, I talk a lot with my hands. If I didn't have the maps there, I'd be trying to tell stories about space and place with my hands. But fortunately, you're able to look at the screen rather than just me gesticulating in the air. I mean, the, having the evidence right in the book itself in an interactive manner allows you to delve deeper in and examine it on your own terms, on your own evidence. You can look at some of the uh, you know, you know, for documents as well as maps and so forth to figure out how this story is connected together. As well, we can do a better job of telling the story about the um, activists who along the way found different ways to challenge the system. Um, here's a quick one here. We can embed oral history interviews right in the text itself. This is, you know, technologically, this is easy to do, but just had thinking about how do we tell the story of Elizabeth Horton Sheff? She's the lead plaintiff in the school integration lawsuit that was launched in 1989. How can we tell her story or snippets of it <laughs> right inside the text itself and help bring people's stories alive that you may not otherwise see or may seem in disjointed ways. That's very much the text, the text task of what I'm putting together with all of this here. So remember, I was pitching this to historians a while ago. These are, what, these are the arguments I make to other historians about why they should consider publishing open access books this way. And I, I, I know the room here is mostly librarians. If you're trying to make partnerships with other faculty, feel free to use or modify any of these arguments. It's all open access here. You can look at the slides. First, I tell people, listen, to get the best of both worlds argument. Uh, and you heard Matt say this as well. It's like, I've got print books, and they're all on the web as well. I have a different model than Matt, but I've got an argument here where I can do both things at once. I can have the stability of print that so people want to read that way. I can also have the discoverability of open access digital work. And at the end of the day, it's still a book. Notice I'm not saying the word blog anywhere through this presentation. I'm doing scholarly books. I just happen to be using WordPress and other derivatives of blogging software to do it. Um, and echoing another argument as well, I believe that this kind of web writing here can really blend the textual narrative with the digital evidence in ways that I could not do with either one alone. I do think that people understand the stories of lines and boundary lines better if they can sort of see the maps or they understand what the activists were explaining, if they can sort of see the videos and read about it at the same time. I furthermore believe that if you are writing about race and education history, you're probably writing about someone's civil rights history. And that civil rights history, it needs to be accessible to the local communities who lived the history. We authors now are in a position where you can work day and night and years and years on a dissertation, bring it to a, a book form. You can go to a well-respected publisher 
And it's very likely nowadays that many of my colleagues, junior colleagues, are finding out that the publishers are willing to bring their books to fruition, traditional books, but with a hardcover only edition, sticker price starting at $45, I've seen $75, I've seen $99 per book, even if the public library in that community can afford a copy, which is questionable in many of our times of scarcity, it's not clear to me whether or not the histories that we are gathering from communities are actually being returned to the communities. Who made this? So we need to think differently about doing this. Furthermore, I argue, and, and you should as well, academic knowledge, it becomes more valuable when it's accessible knowledge. If it's behind a paywall, fewer people can access it. I believe that scholars work in a reputation economy, more so than a dollar economy. You can probably tell this by the way I dress. <laughs> I'm not really in a dollar economy. My professional status is tied to my name attached to ideas, whether or not they're insightful quality ideas, that's up for the audiences to judge, and oh, by the way, the audiences can't really judge if they're quality or not unless they can actually get a hold of them and see what they think about these particular ideas. So um, I picked this up along the way. It's like, if you're in an academic world and you believe that you're gonna make money off of this, you're in the wrong profession, unless you're in the textbook industry. You might make some decent money there, but that certainly isn't the primary focus about why we academics are doing what we're doing. We're in a reputation economy. Our tools for publishing should be in our interests as being ways to leverage, increase our reputations. Um, furthermore, as I said earlier, when doing open access work, you can share drafts of books that still aren't quite done yet, like the one my students and I are still trying to finish, that on the line book, but we can get drafts and comments out to people and get feedback from people before we've finished it. And that's been fabulous for us. The final product is so much better, the <coughs> current product, not even final, the current product is so much better now because of the rich input we've had from people who discovered it along the way and posted on comments or shared ideas about it. Furthermore, with traditional books, your publisher can tell you how many they sold, and if you're smart, you can look at the world cat and find out which libraries bought it and which ones didn't, but that's about as far as you can go. With open access digital books, as you know, we have metrics, and you can actually find out which chapters are interesting and how did people discover them, what links led them to different parts of our open access publications. All of those arguments in more detail with more credits to people who helped me develop them, you can see in the introductions to those two publications there. So a couple technical slides, which I'll just briefly brush over and mention that they're here. I've been using this Pressbooks type software for the On the Line project and also the web writing project. If you're curious about the open source version of this, which is created by the Canadian organization that is a private company, but they have open source software, we basically host all of our editions at Trinity College on some local WordPress type servers um, with our trincall.edu address. It's our server admin saying that's what we're gonna do. Um, it, you know, talking them into this, but making it clear that we develop these books at Trinity, and if they're published elsewhere, the publisher gets the entire content, but we actually keep our link alive as well. We always refer back to the, to the published version, but that's how it gets um, people on the same page. If you haven't seen this type of uh, product called Pressbooks before, it looks like WordPress. That's why authors like me can deal with it. The extra nice thing in it is that you can actually, all through one workflow, say, oh, I want to export, you know, have the web version, but export it in different formats. And for those who care about the technical details, this is what gets people excited because it's one workflow for doing all these different formats, even the more exotic formats that librarians might want to hold onto for long-term preservation purposes or other types of things. Um, and there's alternatives to this as well. I've been using a Gitbook, a different type of platform for a more, uh, this is basically an open access textbook about data visualization. Uh, it's one of those side projects that I shouldn't be working on, but I am, to tell you how to make all those maps. Um, and Scalar is the one that uh, Matthew's been using. I've been learning a lot from him, and I'm seeing other models of people have been using this. I think Matthew is actually one of the, um, among historians, I think he's using it more wisely and, and more effectively than most anyone else I've seen. Um, but I also, I warn people who are about to leap into this, um, we should be thinking carefully before publishing open access. I remind people that, yeah, there's dangers. A very nice book project could turn into a, an unclimbed mountain that could take you forever. You're supposed to laugh. Thank you. Chuck, mild chuckle's fine. Um, a lot of academics, especially historians, they're more accustomed to 
just going to the archives by themselves, just writing by themselves. They're very, they're very socialized, I'd say. Socialized do very individualized work, and it's very much collaborative work is really what pulls together an open access or book, digital book or digital project. No one really does these things alone. A lot of academics who are trained to work alone find themselves out of their comfort zone in a collaborative project. They need to rethink. Uh, many of us who have done this have found ourselves, we had to learn entirely new skills that no one ever dreamed of when we were in graduate school. And I tell people, if you don't like learning new things, maybe you shouldn't be doing this. But I'm trying to sort of play to their, you know, to their side of like, yes, why did we get into this uh, academic life? Because we do like learning new things. Um, maybe we need some more partnerships and help to make some of this thing come together. But I tell people over and over again, the technology is not the hard part. The rethinking, the organization of who's responsible for what and how we tell a story that has digital pieces and text, that is the hard part. And that we can do collaboratively with the skills we have, especially historians. We're good at storytelling, I think. Um, you may have to go out and get competitive grant funding for an ambitious, ambitious project to launch something. In the last session, we talked also about you know, like sustainability. Of like what, 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 how can you build something so that it can survive beyond the, uh, uh, the big startup grant or the mini-sized startup grant? And, and that takes some thinking as well. And you also need to have partnerships in mind. If you're looking for open access publishers, you've got to think about how they're thinking about the world. Um, and that may be different than what the traditional publishers of high status we've looked for in the past. Um, I also tell people, don't try any of this alone. I put a plug in for my best friends, the librarians, especially any librarian who thinks that there's a way to do something digital. Um, I tell academics, they need to look and figure out how to make these partnerships work with people who they may not have drawn upon all of the skills on their campuses or nearby campuses in the same way before. So that's my two cents about on the line and open access presentation books. Thanks. Hello, everyone. So, Brian, earlier you mentioned that the subtitle was Three Digital Book Project. Uh, I think that's interesting because actually the project I'm presenting right now, Educating Harlem, um, did not start as a digital book. It had two separate components to it. One was a digital collection, and I'll talk more about it, and one was an edited volume. And then they converge right now with a digital book project. So I'm presenting this afternoon, but this morning it was Ansley Erickson who started this project, and I'm her graduate assistant at Teachers College. So this is the website, uh, if you want to look at it. It started in 2013 as a partnership with the Institute for Urban and Minority Education at TC Teachers College, and then the Columbia Libraries. So um, like Jack said, you need to imagine a whole crowd of people that are working on it. A lot of students, because um, Professor Erickson has two classes in the fall and spring at Teachers College that create content for our website. And then graduate assistant like myself, and there were others before me. Uh, so like I said, it's an interesting moment in the project because its two uh, main components are converging. And right now, the questions that we have is how to work out the, relationships, uh, the relationship between the two and what the digital book uh, will look like because our edited volume is uh, under contract at the Columbia University Press, and uh, they agreed to have it all online. Um, so content-wise, the Educating Harlem project is about rediscovering the history of education in Harlem, because um, Professor Erickson found, with her colleagues, found that um, a lot of people have misrepresentation about that history, which is what you were talking about with busing. And uh, with the neighborhood uh, as famous of Harlem, as Harlem, people have this idea of a rise of the neighborhood during the Renaissance and all the images that come with that, and then a fall with a decline and uh, traditional representation of what urban e education looks like today. So there are four elements to this project. One is the scholarly volume uh, under contract right now. The second one is a digital collection. It looks like that for the sources. So it promotes um, primary sources that are found in different institutions. So for example, if you look at the second row, this is a collection at uh, the Columbia University archives. And the first one, the Wadley, Wadley Junior High School yearbooks, are yearbooks that are actually from a school in Harlem and they are held 
both at the Schomburg Library, uh, NYPL, and also the school itself. We also have oral histories, um, most often conducted by students in the classes. There's also um, part of the website with uh, student-generated exhibits. So the three that you see there were generated by graduate students, and they explore different aspects of um, educational history in Harlem. So you have the first one that is about um, power professionals in Harlem. The second one is based on an oral exhibit of an educator um, in the late 60s and 70s. And the third one is about youth narratives at a particular school. These exhibits are actually uh, open for review for 30 days after their first publication. And um, we're interested in that process and we're still reflecting on how uh, we can refine it. The project also has a youth participatory research project with students uh, at a school in Harlem, and actually that's the Wadley School uh, um, where we found the, the yearbooks. And so students are generating uh, historical knowledge about their own school. Uh, and finally, as I already mentioned, Professor Erickson has classes where students can learn um, about the history of education in Harlem, but also learn new skills using that Omeka platform um, that we use for the website. So this is where we are right now, and so we're still thinking about the, the process of having a book on web, because that's actually the newest element to the project, because we had the book in print that was uh, at the start of the project and the digital collection. And so now the book on web is a great opportunity for us to have, uh, for example, interactive ma maps like um, uh, Jack showed you, or we can still um, think about a lot of opportunities. Maybe playing the oral history is also a good idea. This is an example of uh, one exhibit uh, showing the paraprofessionals in Harlem. And actually, the student who created that exhibit uh, wrote a reflection piece uh, as part of it and mentioned that having this digital work informed his historical analysis of his topic that he was working on for his dissertation. So he was writing the chapter for the dissertation and was thinking about having this piece online, but he found later that, cre that creating this piece online actually changed the way in which he was thinking about um, his topic. And he plays, uh, he also showcases his uh, primary sources. Here you have an oral history clip uh, that plays uh, as part of the interactive content. Mm -hmm. So one of the goals, as I mentioned, is to uh, showcase the primary sources. And so here is what it looks like on our platform for the yearbooks. There's this, and then you can flip through the pages. So the yearbooks were put on the website after an effort to digitize them. So some of the grant money for the project was used to uh, ask the New York Public Library to digitize uh, the content. So the, the impetus for this is very akin to what you already heard on this panel, is to make primary sources available to the communities that where they're actually from. And the librarian at this school was talking about how she was al always making copies of these yearbooks because people um, wanted to look back. And so having it online makes it more accessible for the people who want to look back uh, on this history. So one very important part of this project is the idea of having uh, a wide array of knowledge producers. So not just academics, but also students, graduate students, high school students. And here you have a graduate student, Lauren Lefty, who created an exhibit about Puerto Rican um, immigration in Harlem and the activism of this particular advo community ac advocate, uh, Evelina Lopez Antonetti, who worked with the uh, Bronx uh, parents. And uh, it's actually right now going through the review process that I mentioned. For 30 days, it's open um, online. And we create Google Forms where people can post uh, their reviews. 
It looks like this. This was for the previous exhibit. And uh, we find this to be very interesting because it helps us create a community of not only scholars, but people interested in that topic. We actually had more reviews than what we invited people to post, which is always a good surprise. And um, it really informed the author uh, who then spent more time ref refining the exhibit. And so once again, an example of new ways of exploring stories um, that just regular text doesn't necessarily uh, allow. So looking back since the project star started, um, there are new things uh, today that weren't necessarily envisioned when, when it started. And the main one maybe is opportunities for uh, graduate pedagogy. And I can uh, speak about that a little bit more. So not only does this provide uh, sources for students who are doing research because they're more accessible than in, a, for example, a high school library in Harlem, especially if you're not uh, in New York, but it also provides opportunity for publishing because it's easier to uh, publish your exhibit than to find a journal, <coughs> apply, and go going through that whole process. It's also easier to reach out to reviewers through the process that we uh, set up. And myself as a graduate assistant, I see that there are a lot of opportunities for a diversity of tasks that are not necessarily involved in traditional graduate <coughs> assistantship. And I also now know new parts of the in university, and for example, the libraries, through all the meetings with the um, Center for Digital Research and Scholarship. And uh, as I was talking about with Professor Erickson earlier, there's still one trade-off, I would say, in doing this type of assistantship, is that people don't necessarily know what you're doing. And when I say I'm an assistant on this great digital project, people think maybe I'm coding for this website or that I'm you know, reading all the comments and it's not necessarily clear what tasks are involved. So coming back to the main question that we have here for the audience is the type of relationship that we can envision uh, between those three parts of the project, the newest one being the book on web. And um, this is an example of a relationship, for example. So the exhibit I was showing earlier, Communion Classroom, about um, paraprofessionals in Harlem is actually <coughs> was actually created by Nick Jurovich, who's also an author in the edited volume uh, for the project. And so as he was talking about how this informed his understanding, he reflected more specifically on this primary source, so a page in the TC Week journal, and he said that creating his exhibit brought his attention to this picture that he was just including in passing in his uh, writing of his chapter, and this reminded him in, in uh, featuring this as part of the exhibit that the history that he was talking about, the history of struggles of paraprofessional in Harlem, was also a history actually of a lot of energy and joy as you can see uh, in this picture. And the woman that you see uh, on the left side is the person that he interviewed for uh, oral history. So the project is now facing a few challenges with, with this new um, publication triangle. Um, one of them is coherence. So for example, we have Nick Jurovich who created an exhibit and a chapter. So we're still figuring out if these are in competition with one another, if they're complementing one another. Uh, so that's one type of challenge. Uh, there's also a coherence uh, challenge, content-wise, but also visually, and that comes with any digital project, I think. And um, the challenge that uh, Jack mentioned, which is when is this ever done? And that's one that we're struggling with and we're maybe thinking of moving it to um, a minimal style website once we think it's, it's done, if that uh, ever happens. <coughs> so um, thank you for listening. And we particularly appreciate questions or suggestions regarding that 
triangle that you saw. Just by way of sort of setting terms of the discussion, one of the, I, w I officially had to ask at, act as a discussant at the, at the last session. So I have one or two thoughts that we're sharing before we turn over to questions. Uh, again, what, you know, we have a Mellon grant here for publishing digital books uh, or, or digital scholarship that are sort of monograph-like. And so that was one of the reasons why we thought this, this panel made sense to have here at, at, in the library as well as um, is happening at the History of Education Society conference. Uh, something that we might touch on or might not, is the, the other part of our grant is working, you know, the library here is taking care of the sort of publishing of the digital projects, and a number of us in the room are, are busy with that. The, the dean of the faculty is working on the other side of things, which is getting uh, tenure and promotion documentation put into place about how, how do these works count. Um, so that's certainly something that I, I think our panelists could speak to if that's of interest to anybody. Uh, I found myself also reflecting that, uh, and maybe this is because I'm not a historian, but a lot of the work that, that these three are engaged in is about recovery. Recovery of, of parts of stories that have sort of gone missing, um, and then making that those recovered materials public. And I don't know if it's something about the internet in general, but this seems uh, very of a piece of, of what has happened in other fields of digital scholarship. In the 90s, digital humanities in the 90s was uh, things like the Women's Writers Project, of recovering <coughs> things that had been ignored, and here we have an easy way of publishing um, that's very low cost, and we can make new, or not new, but we can, we can give to new audiences very old things and help change the story that we're telling about things. Um, the, the third thing is we're saying is, is just underscoring how we've got three very different models for publication here, where Matt's publishing with a very traditional press, um, although they, are, they do interesting things. Uh, and you could see his website as supplemental, as sort of all of the stuff that can't fit into the print form of the book. Um, but as he indicated, it takes a different approach. It, it, he's thinking about it as an educational site. And so, so that's his model. Jack's book, when it's done, will look pretty much the same in book form as it does on the web. We'll have the same content that, you know, the, the maps won't work, they won't be interactive in the print form, but it's going to be more or less the same thing. And then Esther and Anza Erickson's work on Educating Harlem, they're still figuring out how, they, how the different parts relate to each other. When, um, when they started, they didn't think there, would, you know, there was going to be an edited collection, and then there was going to be all this, this digital uh, collection, and they, they weren't going to intersect in, as much as they are, are now. So we have, we have different models how we do this. The last thought that I'll share uh, relates to the difficulties we have in a library when people make these digital objects. Uh, Matt's book, when we buy it, it comes in, it's received in acquisitions, and it gets put on a shelf. And because I bought it through YBP, we get metadata, and it goes nicely into our catalog, and somebody can look up and, and find it. His online project, however, which is out there and is free, it's not very easy to get that into a catalog. Uh, we can ask a cataloger to put it in so that it does come up when somebody does a search in the catalog. But that's, as opposed to an automated process, that's a, that's a high touch process. And it depends on somebody saying, there is this thing <coughs> out there, it should be cataloged, it should be made visible. I, I've had a conversation with Ned recently and, and Sam and a couple other people about the um, debates in digital humanities series that University of Minnesota puts out. Uh, we have the book copies. Uh, there is a free online version, and and then there's an ebook copy. I could buy the ebook copy and pay $180, um, and then that would get listed in. But there is a free ebook. If the book is checked out off the shelf, there is a free one that anyone could use. But it's this challenge of how do we get it into the catalog? So. Our patrons, our users, our scholars know that it's there and, and can find it. So that, so that I think is a very, uh, that's a challenge we face in libraries. As, as scholars do more and more of this work, how do we help them get their stuff visible and help our scholars here at Brown know that this, this scholarship is out there? So those are, those are my sort of brief summative thoughts. 
Um, and so I'll turn the time over to you, as the audience, to ask any questions our panelists you might, you might have. Yes, we'll, we'll put the big backdrop back there. Oh, okay. <coughs> yes, Sarah. Um, well, just to pick up on what you were saying, Brian, and this is, I guess, a question for Matt first, but um, I'm the education librarian, and so uh, this question of how do we get the, how would we make sure that people were able to find the, the web, either as a component of the publication or as the publication itself. Um, so we have the book, and it's in the catalog. Um, it seems like it's an obligation for the publishers to communicate all of that in the forms that we get our information. Um, so I guess the question of communication is, is important, but also communicating with the publishers themselves. So um, I don't know about I mean, the three of you in terms of your experience working with the publishers to look at um, different forms of publication and how we would then make the scholarship available through our tools. It's a great question until Brian mentioned it this morning. I never thought about that, sort of how this stuff gets into the library. So um, with my second two books, because I knew I was creating digital projects while I was creating them, and the table of contents are, is a, a little bit after the, and this is in the book, after, after the table of contents says, for more information on the book, resources, video clips, visit this URL. So this one has whybussingfailed.com. So that's in the book. And if you go to the publisher's website, there's also a link, a link there. But I would have to email them because I don't know if they, if the material they send to the people who sell the books to you includes that. I'd never. I'm looking at your table of contents that's in our catalog. Yeah. And it ends, it doesn't include that as an item. OK, so the hard copy does, but the digital the, the, yeah. the information. Okay. So it's just a matter of the publisher putting that into the record. Okay. And it's interesting that it isn't yeah. currently, I mean, just as an example. Yeah that's, yeah, that's great. I had never known or thought about that before. The only other insight I have on this is um, uh, while we were working on the, um, uh, the first two open access books with Michigan, um, we had a contract with Michigan, but they, you know, they weren't giving final approval until the whole thing was done. We wanted to make uh, a web writing and writing history in the digital age discoverable while they were in public draft form. So we went to our librarians, and at Trinity, it's a Trinity, Conn College, and Wesley, it's a consortium. And I went to our librarians and I said, what can you do? And they said, we're going to create a mark record. And it's going to be the title of the book, and it's going to be called the Trinity College in Progress Edition. And here's the web link. And they made those mark records. I don't know for sure, but I believe that now that there's the Michigan published version and the Trinity College uh, draft version, I think they show up as basically as different editions of the same title, depending on how you do your WorldCat search. So it's another strategy of like, you're right, publishers should be doing a lot of this. I'm stunned by how many conversations I've had to have with publishers and editorial people along the way about, have you thought about this yet? Because even they don't often see the whole processes, or it's already compartmentalized in such a way that they don't feel that the editorial people who may be more forward-leaning don't feel that the some of the production people are keeping up. So I think there's alternative ways to get into the system rather than just the publisher doing everything. And I think it's worth saying that, that it's not also just publishers, but there's the opportunity for libraries with repositories, of course, to host some of these materials. Um, and then I know because I was at meetings at the MLA last week, um, the MLA bibliography is a place where sometimes digital projects get listed, not very often. The MLA has its own repository and something that they have on the, uh, it's on the, the sort of five-year plan is the objects that anyone in the field can submit to that repository. Those are going to be ported into the MLA's international bibliography. And you can put file, like video or data into there. And so eventually, some of this, sort of, that stuff will make its way into the international bibliography and then it will come into our databases as, as discoverable in that way. But, so I think there, there is motion in a lot of places on how this will happen, but at the moment, it's still a really, it's a sticky wicket. What, one more thought on this, if I can, is just uh, may, may be helpful for uh, Stir and Ainsley's project. Um, a lot of the interactive maps that you saw, those are um, the home 
server for that is the University of Connecticut's Map and Geographic Information Center, so their geography center in the library system. And they've been very good about making those, you know, discoverable within their catalog, but are also very careful. Whenever we put up a piece of digital evidence, we're always writing in, see more, go to the on-the-line site. Because we know this, people discover the digital evidence and say, oh, I've never seen this before. And we want to lead them to the more interpretive work that helps glue together those pieces. Because that's what they really want to see as well. Like, how does this fit into history? So we're always being careful about don't assume people will find your book first. They may find the evidence, and you need to lead them, leave enough breadcrumbs to get them back to the book. Yeah. Um, so my question is kind of like three parts. So like, first of all, um, if digital books are, or digital projects are like so good, like what do you think is like the advantage of having printed books, like besides its stability? and? Um, also, like, do you think that printed books will eventually like disappear, like, in the future? And if so, like, what would the definition of book be when, like, all of printed books disappear? Uh, sure. I was mentioning to Jack before, just before we got started. Um, when I was about to give my job talk at Arizona State University, where I am right now, a week before, I pulled up one of my digital sites, and everything was gone. All the <laughs> images and materials were gone. So for me. The book is, I know exactly where it's going to be, right? <laughs> 100 years from now, 200 years from now, right? I don't know what else is going to be on, but the book is going to be there. Um, so I think there's, there's a stability there. I um, also think for long form argument, I don't like to read uh, 100,000 words just online, right? So I think, I think there's a value to having that material online, open access. But I think if I want to actually sit down and read a scholarly monograph, I'm probably still always, my generation might always want to do that in a book form. Um, I think the, the big sort of question in our field is less about the book than about the, is it, is it valuable? Is it doing good work? That's usually sort of through peer review, right? So I think that's where I'm interested in sort of seeing how this develops. So I don't care what sort of media gets presented in. If people in our field can say, that's good, like this is good stuff, right? And that's what, what I'm interested in, in advancing. I'm less sort of dogmatic about what that looks like. I think, I don't think the book is likely to leave us any time in our lifetimes, hopefully, because I think it does, it has something permanent that, um, the digital is unlikely to be able to provide uh, soon. I'll just add in, um, uh, you heard me make this pitch for, I'm looking for the best of both worlds. I don't want to get rid of the physical book. I want to make sure that readers can read the content that my colleagues and I are producing in their preferred formats. But notice that's plural. You know, it's like I've got people who do want to read just a piece of something. Maybe, maybe they're only going to read you know, 5,000 words on the web, and they want to interact with the materials. I've got other people who want to be able just to flip through pages of a book and find uh, portions of the narrative that really draw their attention in. And I want to make all of those groups happy. Um, here's a good test. Uh, uh, a year ago, I went and taught for a semester at uh, nearby Wesleyan University. And as you know, part of the course I designed for them, I said, OK, I'll do one week on this book in progress. And I said to the students, about 20 of them, you know, all, all you know, under the age of 21, I said, you get to choose which format you want. You can read the online version, or I'll give you free photocopies of those who want print version. I was trying to make it like, you know, no cost for them. Half and half. Half chose the P it was PDFs at that time, PDF pages. The other half preferred interacting with it online. And it was very different types of reasons. And at that time, there was a couple of articles coming out where some cognitive psychologists were saying that sometimes people actually remember things better if they can write on pages because they can, in their minds, they meant, oh, I remember in that upper left corner of somewhere around page 30 or 40, I did that mark or something like that. And I respect that. So I never tell people I'm trying to get rid of the book. I have no idea what books will look like in the future. But I do know we need to start thinking about books in plural forms. I agree. I think there's a widespread paranoia that the book will disappear, but people learn in very different ways. And actually, um, sometimes having the, well, like you said, having the digital project actually enhances the interest in the print book. So I'm not worried that all those digital projects actually harm the book itself. So I'm not worried so much about the book going away as I am about readers going away. Um, you, all of you have addressed the issue of digital storytelling and how it differs somewhat from the book. Can you talk a little bit about what makes, in your mind, that digital product somehow more readable or more understandable than the print version? 
start with? Yeah. Um, so I, I chose today to sort of like to bring you into like one chapter of the book. And I specifically chose a chapter where um, there's a, a story about uh, federal government policy. Um, that Those words often put my 19-year-olds to sleep. And then I, I have this eye-catching uh, redlining map. And, and that usually wakes up an audience. Um, I, mean, after, I mean, we are sort of entranced by shiny objects. Um, I think that the best case I can make for merging those types of elements together, narrative text and digital evidence, is that I persuade more people by having both together on the page that, yeah, these racist structures were real. And, and look at the influence they had. Because I don't just show a picture of it, but I, in the text itself, I have to make an argument and explain and try to be as persuasive about what they did and did not shape of the, of the cities and suburbs we see today. And I, you know, I'll, I'll say anecdotally, I, I'm hearing from people saying, wow, I understood it better. I noticed it more when I saw that, that chapter and saw both forms of it. Um, I also have people who say, yeah, and then I clicked on this part, and I went to this other site, and I learned about this, and then I went on this other part, and this other site. And in a very much the, what's the best part about the web? It does have a rich way of telling stories with rich forms of evidence. What's the bad part about the web? It's the web. You can go off and learn lots of other things as well. And other people, I assume, read other sites and stumble into mine. I'm not so sure what's bad about all of that, because I do believe that we all should be learning new things. But if my goal was keep people riveted on my book and not let them go anywhere else, I mean, if that was the goal, then I wouldn't put links into other places, which would kind of be crazy. So I'm stuck a little bit here about, yeah, I think I'm getting more readers. They definitely aren't reading the book from cover to cover. They're dipping into parts that are interesting to them. I'm, I'm OK with that. Yeah, I'm going to say the same thing, that sources are, are really what we bring into the book that catches an audience, I think. The oral histories or the yearbooks, people can be driven to the sources for a variety of reasons, and they know that they can find them there if we good good job at communicating that. So we reach into audiences that maybe would not be reached otherwise, but we maybe lose, like you said, lose some attention by people going from one exhibit to this other site to something else. But I would say that people do that with books anyway. Mm -hmm. Like you look, you, you read the introduction, the author is summarizing the chapter, and you say, okay, I'm only, go I'm only going to read chapter seven. Mm -hmm. So that's not such a big trade off. Yeah, I would just echo this and sort of approach it in two ways. One, being comfortable with the fact that people approach nonfiction in bite sized chunks. Right? So most people don't read nonfiction from start to finish, and I think the web is a sort of a good place for that, that I don't expect any of my digital projects that people are going to start from the beginning, click through all the links, and that they can get something where they spend five minutes or an hour with it. That's the goal. And the other thing is, once they're online, you can share them and sort of push them out. So I do a lot through Twitter this way. Right? So and I think it's useful because if your work is already online, then when it comes up in the news, and this has been important for me, that the issues I'm writing about in New York in the 50s and 60s are going on right now. Right, in the Upper West Side about people, these debates, I can I have them here online, so I can link to say, you saw this in your Times, here's this. You saw this, I got this. And not to like name drop, but a couple of people who blurred my book, Nicole Hannah-Jones from New York Times, Jelani Cobb, who's a Columbian writes for the New Yorker, I made contact with them via Twitter. Right? So there are people who have platforms on Twitter. I had the material, they had discussed something peripheral to it, and I said, hey, I liked what you said, here's more information if you want to learn about it. Right? So it's a way for us to get in these conversations that is really valuable. It's, Better than just sort of saying, hey, I wrote about this. It's behind a paywall. Or go check it out from the library or go buy it from Amazon. But here's 500 words that articulate with more historical depth what you're saying. Right? And that's a good way to make professional connections and sort of get our work circulating. And let's underscore what you just mentioned. When the people you did just mention, they are not full-time academics yeah. who assume that everybody else in the world has access to all of JSTOR. You know, they are journalists or other public people who who are very aware that you can't easily tap into what's behind a paywall. I'm stunned by how many of my faculty colleagues think that everyone can look at the PDFs that they're sending out on email or Facebook or something like that. It's like, it's, so, so we need to, be able to do a lot of education inside about the walls that are around us that we may not even realize, a lot of our colleagues don't even realize the walls that we've locked ourselves into. Um, you mentioned the uh, open draft part of it as being a, a method for feedback, um, going kind of on a tangent of what you've said just now, uh, the open draft 
could also be an early access, early access, uh, you know, bite size access to to bits and pieces of it instead of waiting till you're like at the very end and like here's everything, you know, just uh, you know you work yeah. on this uh, chapter and there it goes and you can link to it and tweet it out and uh, they don't have to consume the whole thing but they might be willing to come back after they've looked at that first thing as well. So. Um, and a lot of uh, a lot of what I learned with this uh, that sort of hybrid open peer review model, um, I was following what uh, Catherine Fitzpatrick and um, who was her colleague at Kathleen Fitzpatrick. Kathleen Fitzpatrick and Catherine uh, Catherine Rowe. Catherine Rowe, who was at Smith College. She was at Bryn Mawr and she's Bryn Mawr. At Smith. Now she's the dean of faculty at Smith or provost at Smith, maybe. Yeah. So, anyways, um, I learned a lot from them. Um, uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick, it was her planned obsolescence book. What she did in that arrangement, and this is an arrangement she worked out with NYU Press, I believe, was she put the draft of the book online for open peer review. And the final product was only for sale through NYU. So, she worked out an arrangement where, you know, it's a different model. And I, I certainly understand it's like different publishers would like different ways of doing this. We should have thousands of models and see which ones flourish over time. But it's, um, uh, we're so stuck in the ways we've always done things about peer review that it doesn't make sense. It's Kathleen Fitzpatrick. She argues that all of that academic labor of peer review is hidden labor that none of us get credit for. And nobody even really sees it except two or three people. So the experiment is, if you allow people to do open peer review and you require everyone to have their name there on the open peer review, you know, we did it where people who wrote, you know, 1,000 comments, everyone had to be named. You couldn't do anonymous. The real question was is, were people all nicey-nice and just say, oh, you did a great job, Matthew, nicey-nice? It's like, no. We went through and out of the 1,000, easily, uh, no one was nasty, but it was, there were substantive comments. We easily found easily two-thirds of that 1,000 were substantive comments that were improving the final draft. Thank you for such a uh, great panel uh, discussion. I'm going to go back to something, uh, Brian, I think I understood you to say, and I, help me if I misunderstood, was um, something to the effect that um, the web has enabled us to, to be more reflective, to go back in history and so on. But I would say that in general terms, the work that each of you is doing or uh, ha has, has completed um, under any, uh, whether traditional scholarship or digital scholarship, would in fact be reflective in nature and rely on uh, historical sources. And one of the things that I sometimes wonder is, is how much different is the research that um, humanists or um, social scientists do today versus what they've done in the past. I mean, the real essence of that research. And the, I want to compare that, and maybe Andy, you would say something, um, with the research of scientists, which is actually quite different uh, because the <coughs> tools uh, that they use for research and the, the products that they make are themselves uh, digital rather than uh, a, a recreation uh, or a, a scan or whatever. So I wonder if you could reflect on that and um, maybe your own experience or your thoughts uh, about how your research, if your research has actually fundamentally changed. Um, very good question. Um, I'm thinking that my research is actually more similar now to the way I did research pre-digital, pre-web. It's my scholarly communication that's substantially different. Um, um, and I, I would push back as well. I'm thinking about, um, I'm th you know, I work with biologists on my campus, environmental scientists. Um, they aren't creating digital products. In their minds, their research is, unless it misunderstood your question, 
their research, you know, environmental biologists, their research methods are very similar. They're using digital tools and they can make more types of calculations or communicate their findings with others. But there's many STEM faculty and STEM researchers who aren't creating digital products. In fact, they look at me as like, oh, he makes those digital maps that are re-showing the past through different eyes. You know, we can take a scan of a map, but we're trying to show more in it. We're trying to do more analysis. Sometimes there's more mathematical analysis of what was the factors that were driving different neighborhoods in different directions. So I'm, I'm, I'm still puzzling over the question. I'm going to hand it off to my colleagues as I puzzle over your question some more. But I'm, I'm not sure if I agree with the categories the way you presented them, respectfully. Respectfully, yeah. Uh, I think, I mean, for the Educating Harlem project, the research in terms of historical analysis is similar to what you probably have in mind people were doing before. I think this project was also an opportunity to have other people do research, historical research that weren't traditionally doing it. So we engaged, for example, high school students in um, historical research with the after school program and uh, through the classes we have students that teach college that are not in the history program to historical research. So maybe that's a way in which research has changed. Yeah. And, and are you thinking also with the high schoolers they have more access to some of the digitized archival materials that in the past that, that, that it would have been very hard to get high schoolers yeah. into the archives that have only nine to four hours or something time, like that? Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good question. I'll try to answer a couple ways. Um, I think overall, it might be that the maybe the bar is higher now for what we're the number of sources we're expected to engage with, right? Just because I don't think this is entirely true, but a lot more stuff is digitized. It's relative to 50 or 100 years ago. It's easier to travel nationally and across the world to find different archives and find stuff that isn't digitized. I think it's still just hard to find the stuff that you don't know that you're looking for. Though. So the th first thing that came to mind with your question was my engagement with um, African American newspapers. So for my dissertation when I was here, and then for uh, my first book, I went to Temple University Urban Archives and sat there with the microfilm reader, right, looking through the Philadelphia Tribune for 15 years to find all of the stories related to school segregation and American bandstand. Right? By the time I was working on my second project, which was just a couple years later, that had all been digitized by ProQuest. So for that one, myself and a dozen research assistants downloaded 10,000 articles from these nine African American newspapers, right? That searching for keywords around busing and school desegregation. Now, it's conceivable I could have had access to those nine newspapers if I went to the Library of Congress and looked at them on microfilm. But that sort of digital moment, I think, made it a lot easier to get that work done in a matter of six months than it would have yeah. previously. Um, going through 10,000 newspaper articles in PDF form on your computer, is, it's a little soul crushing, right? <laughs> so it's, it's very efficient, right? But it's not, I missed the kind of exploration of that first project. So the, the project I've been working on this year, the digital product, the Black Quotidian site, was partly meant to try to get that sense of exploration back in. Because when you're just looking for keywords, I have no idea what else is on the page. Right? I find a bunch of stuff about busing, but I don't know that there's something about the Rotary Club or about uh, women's society pages. Right. So going back and just looking, so I'm looking through digital stuff, but just picking a random date and flipping through and looking for something that catches my interest. Right. Or looking for something that is off the beaten path. I think that's what I'm interested in as a scholar now is trying to find the stuff I don't know that I'm looking for. So. I have time for one more question. Um, I have two. That's okay. You go for it. One is, did you have any issues with copyright? Um, you were talking about the downloadable content. Sometimes things are available in print but not digital. Did you have any issues with the reverse? If you did, how did you get around them? Um, for copyright, for mine, I reached, so for, I guess there's maybe three answers. For things that are, are held by places or people I want to work with again, I'll reach out and request copyright and then make sure I use it. For things like if I want to use the cover of a Time magazine, um, I'll use it and if they ask me to take it down, I would take it down. Um, for video content, I upload it to Critical Commons, which is a fair use advocacy site. Can you explain that one? Because remember, I told you earlier, yeah. I learned about Critical Commons through how you used it very creatively and I, maybe yeah. people may not be aware of how this one works. Yeah, so there's a website called Critical Commons, criticalcommons.org that you can find online. You create an account um, and then you can upload material. So to upload feature is similar to YouTube, but the thing that distinguishes it is that if you publish, if you include some textual commentary on it, some textual analysis, and then click save, then it makes it public, and then you've made a, a fair use claim to it. Right? So we as scholars have the ability to use clips from Sopranos. Uh, Jason Mattel is a TV scholar who has a great book called Complex TV. It's a scalar project and a, a textual book. But he's using stuff from, from Mad Men, from Sopranos, from Breaking Bad, four and five minute clips, but he's able to use them because he's analyzing them. Right? We as scholars have that ability. We, we don't have it unless we use it. So you can make that fair use claim for 
visual material. And that again is Critical Commons. Um, but for other stuff, it's I and I think people t take different approaches on this. I'm honestly I'm a little bit more loosey goosey with it, right? That for stuff from Temple University Urban Archives, archives that I want to make sure I have a good relationship with, I will request permission and use it in that way. For ones that are large commercial ventures, I'm more likely to just use it, and then if they ask me to take it down, take it down. But that's that's idiosyncratic. I'm not suggesting it's best practices for everyone. I just uh, uh, because mine is a local case study, um, I'm usually um, uh, uh, talking with uh, uh, local historical societies, libraries, and so forth that may or may not have digitized material, but I have found it. I think it's important to tell the story, and I've learned, I've seen interesting shifts over the years. Um, early on, it was very difficult for me to persuade the um, uh, the uh, Hartford History Center director at the Hartford Public Library to digitize some of their materials and let me sh show their materials on the web as part of the story I was telling. They're very resistant. And because it was sort of like, they thought that their revenue stream depended upon people using the photocopier. I mean, when, you're, when your revenue stream depends on people putting 25 cents in at a time, you know you're in trouble. They also were relying on people, on academics have, you know, being able to plunk down $100 or more to get permission to use a photograph at high quality resolution for the cover of a book or something like that. And there were many more images than I had money for. But the more we talked about it, and the more I realized, I tried to think about from their point of view what was important to these libraries or historical societies, the most common theme I found was they really needed to make a case for why they were relevant. They looked at me as somebody who could help possibly explain why there's good stuff in those archives that other people should continue to fund the existence of. So that got us on the same page. When I can show them, look, um, I'm going to, uh, uh, I, here's the I say, here's the web page. I'd like to give you know, this image here, uh, credit your library here, show the link clearly, you know, recommend all this, and make it clear. Whenever anybody sees it, they're going to see the link to your facility right there. And it's a link, and it's going to take them all to your collection. And I can maybe help uh, put an undergraduate intern in there to help digitize a, a collection or something like that. Then they started to see things as a two-way street. And all of a sudden, we as historians, we, we, we're playing value-added role. It's like we're helping archi small archives and libraries see that, we're helping the world see all the value they have that people didn't see at first glance. Yeah. And we also have very local projects that we <coughs> I mean, you're asking about permission, basically, and we cultivate our relationships, and we are very careful to ask for permissions. And um, Professor Erickson was mentioning this this morning. Uh, Columbia University has a very complicated relationship with uh, the Harlem neighborhood, so we're very careful in making sure that people actually really want this stuff online, and for the one of the yearbooks that we have, we are sure that they do. So we're very careful in uh, cultivating those relationships. Second question. Um, it's about the open access review. Is that only, um, you only receive feedback from scholars, or is that also from people in the community? I have done the, uh, the hybrid model of open peer review. I've done it so far with the two finished products you saw briefly. Both of those were, were um, one's called Writing History in the Digital Age, the other one's called Web Writing. Um, they're edited volumes. They're very much, you know, mostly academics talking to academics, but the rules were anyone could comment on these. They didn't have to prove that they had an affiliation or something like this, but they had to list their name. Um, as we looked through the, uh, you know, typical thousand comments or so, I think in both cases it was about 80 or so people. So it was not a thousand people making a thousand comments. It was about 80 people, and they varied in numbers of comments across them. Um, and we looked at those and we did determine from like everyone had to put an email address to sort of like to, to get a commenting account. Most of them did end in .edu's, not every single one. Um, this on the line book that is very much a local history story, um, still people who write comments tend to be academics or people who are, maybe they're journalists or people who are comfortable in the world of words. But Community activists, people running the local cable access channel, other people have used content or asked me to come and talk with them or do some event about something like this. And that's exciting to me because I understand that even just the world of words, people whose job it is to move words around, um, that's a line. And, uh, but history belongs to people on both sides of that line. And I'm thrilled that this open format and the open peer review allows people to sort of engage in that in different ways. But most of the time, People who want to write comments on it, 
at least on academic kind of stuff, they tend to be people who are academics already. If they want to go, if it's a troll on the internet who wants to go bash people, they're going to go to something that's got much higher visibility than these little academic sites. We have never had troll problems because we aren't big enough to attract trolls. We're not worth their time, as far as I can tell. Well, will you all join me in thanking our panelists?